Okay, everyone. So let's uh, uh, carry on. Uh, and uh, just to remind you from yesterday, we were looking at this sutta called the uh, Tapusa Sutta. And it's about this lay person who goes to Venerable Ananda and he talks about how the uh, monastic Sangha is living a, la a life of renunciation. Uh, the Pali word for renunciation is nekama, yeah? and nekama in the suttas always means the opposite of karma, always the opposite of the sensory world, the five sense world. Uh, and nekama means like giving up interest in that world. It doesn't actually mean giving up that world, because that's impossible. We have to live with the five senses, uh, but it means that you have less interest in that world, uh, less attachment, less craving, etc. And then he says to Venerable Ananda that this is kind of the difference between the um, uh, lay life, the, nor the normal lay life, I should say. Maybe there are, of course, there are some lay people who live a, a little bit like monastics. Uh, and he says it seems like an abyss uh, to the lay people, the idea of giving up the five senses. Uh, that's kind of uh, very sweet, <laughs> the abyss. And uh, I just wanted to, so we're going to carry on talking a little bit more about the five senses and the world of sensual pleasures. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to remind you why we are doing this. Because uh, I know that sometimes uh, people take this the wrong way. Uh, and they think it means that there is no pleasure in life, we shouldn't enjoy ourselves and all of these kind of things. Uh, and I want to make absolutely sure that you don't take it that way. It is okay to enjoy yourself in the world of the five senses. That is not the point of this. Uh, and I have often found that some Buddhist lay people, they take these things far too seriously. Uh, and they end up living lives that are really dry and boring. Uh, and the next generation of Buddhists, they wonder what on earth we are doing. And there's no way that they want to become Buddhist because the Buddhists seem like the most miserable people of all. Uh, <laughs> And that is not what we want to do. We want to have good lives. And part of a good life is to enjoy the ordinary pleasures of the world. So please don't take it the wrong way. So what is the purpose of this then? Well, the purpose of this is really just to let go a little bit of the attachment and craving and desires in that world. Enjoy that world, but with less attachment less kind of powerful cravings, uh, a little bit more bird's eye view, understanding the downsides of that world. Uh, yeah, that is kind of the idea here. Just a little bit less attachment, a little bit more clarity about what is going on. Enjoy, but enjoy in a slightly different way. Uh. And I was mentioning this, this, this the other day, and I mention this usually on every retreat that I do, that uh, what is fascinating in the suttas uh, is that when someone has a very profound meditation experience, uh, they come out of the fourth jhana, or they are an arahant or whatever, actually they are able to enjoy the world of the five senses even more. They enjoy it more than before, but they don't have any craving or attachment in that world. And the very fact that they don't have attachment and craving, it is that is the reason why they are able to enjoy more. Because instead of the mind always going into the future, going into the past, going into attachment, you're able to stay with what you are experiencing 100%. Your mindfulness is purified. This is kind of weird, right? It's not as if the arahants, they cannot enjoy the world of the five senses. They just enjoy it in a different way. And this is very fascinating. So we want to move our minds a little bit in that direction. Yeah, so remember the purpose here. Don't take this the wrong way. Otherwise, we get a very bad reputation as Buddhists. And we are the dry, boring Buddhist, uh, whereas Christians, they have a lot of fun, they have all the kind of a joy in the world. Uh, so we don't wanna, want to do that. Uh. So what happens? What is the purpose of all this? What happens when we lose some of the attachment to that world? Uh? And, and I should say, it is quite hard to do this. Uh. And the reason why it is so hard is because we are immersed in the world of the five senses. Uh. It is everything we know, right? From the moment we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, the five senses are around us all the time. That is our life. That is what the world is about for most people. And maybe occasionally when you go on a meditation retreat uh, and you get some insight, some understanding into uh, the mind which withdraws from those five senses, you feel some joy, some peace within her. Uh, maybe at those times are the only time when you're kind of a little bit out of the world of the five senses. Uh, but the rest of the time we are fully immersed in that world. Uh, 
That is why it is so hard to let go of, because it is our whole existence consists of the five sense world. So when we talk about sensual pleasures, uh, you may think it only means like, you know, enjoying that world, but no, it means the whole world that we are immersed in all the time. Uh, that is why it is difficult to let go of some of the attachment. Uh, that's why we need to contemplate the downside of that world. We already know the joys of that world. Uh, they are so obvious. Uh, this is how we grow up. This is how we learn to indulge our five senses. Uh, but to see the downside, to see the drawbacks, the adinava, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, is actually that is the hard part. Uh, and that takes a bit of work. Uh, it takes a bit of reflection. It takes a bit of standing back. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do right here and right now. Uh. And the effect of that, if we do it in the right way, is really a twofold effect. Uh. The first effect uh, is that it makes us better human beings. Uh. It makes you a more kind and caring person. Uh. It makes you more compassionate. Uh. Why? Because as long as you are too attached to the world, the five senses, uh, you will be willing to do things that are immoral in the name of the pursuit of those five sense world. Uh, yeah, if that world is very, very important to you, you will be, sometimes you will get upset and you will say things that are not quite right. Uh, you will do things that, that are not quite appropriate. And certainly you will think, think things uh, that aren't right. You will get upset and angry because the world of the five senses isn't going your way. Uh, yeah, so, but if you get a bit more distance from that world, a bit less attachment, uh, you start to understand the downside of that world. That, that world isn't actually as important as you thought it was. Uh, it makes you a better human being. Uh, and one of the most important things for us on this path is to become better human beings. Uh, this is the foundation of everything we do yeah, on this path. Uh, this is what makes meditation possible. Uh, this is what makes a good rebirth in the future possible. Everything on this path comes from this idea of being kind, caring, compassionate, understanding human beings. Uh, so if by getting the bit more of the bird's eye perspective uh, can help us with that, uh, it's wonderful and very, very useful. Uh. So this is the first point of reflecting on the downside, the drawback of the sensory world. Uh. The second point is that because uh, meditation practice is based on the idea of letting go of that world uh, and entering the world of the mind uh, by Reflecting in this way, it enables meditation. Uh, every time you understand the drawbacks of this world a little bit deeper, uh, it actually tends to help your meditation as well, to take it one step deeper at the same time. Uh. So in this way, these things are useful. But remember to do this in the right way, right? Uh, and uh, when you do it in the right way, uh, you become a happy Buddhist rather than a miserable Buddhist. Uh. So please be happy Buddhists, uh, because that's what we want to be. That's the point of Buddhism, right? Is to make us happy, not to make us miserable. So please get these things the right way. And then uh, maybe the next generation will also be inspired uh, uh, by these beautiful teachings that we have available to us. Uh, there's a little bit by way of background, just to make sure that we uh, think about these things in the right way. And now we're going to see what the Buddha has to say to Tapusa and Venerable Ananda uh, in terms of this distinction between renunciation and the enjoyment of the five senses. Uh, okay. Sorry for interrupting yeah. everyone. I'm very grateful to Ajahn for this teaching. It is a reminder of what I learned during his workshop on reflecting wisely, okay. which was done a few years ago via Zoom. That was a really wonderful <laughs> retreat. Thank you so much. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu, with okay. gratitude. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. That's very, really, it's nice to get that positive feedback. So um, that's great. Uh, Okay, so now let's continue with the Tapusa Sutta and what uh, the Buddha tells uh, uh, these uh, uh, tells Tapusa and Venerable Ananda. And uh, <coughs> so he starts off by saying, "This is the Buddha speaking." He says, "That's so true, Ananda. That's so true. Yeah, that there is on the one hand the monastic sangha." Pl uh, uh, practicing, um, giving up a little bit of that world, and then you have the, the ordinary lay people, as, 
emphasize ordinary here, who are attached to that and who see renunciation as an abyss. And now the Buddha is going to explain a bit more about his own background and his own movement towards this understanding. And again, you see here, before my awakening, yeah, this is kind of the theme of this retreat, the idea of looking at how the Buddha thought about this, how he was motivated uh, in his own pursuit of the Dhamma. Before my awakening, uh, when I was still unawakened, uh, but intent on awakening, uh, I too thought, uh, renunciation is good, uh, seclusion is good. Yeah, so this is uh, the things I've just been talking about now, the idea of why a degree of renunciation is useful, yeah, and this is how you incline your mind in that direction. And you see here seclusion is good because seclusion is very closely related to the idea of renunciation. Uh, to be able to be secluded, you have to renounce a little bit. Uh, and then the seclusion, if you do it in the right way, it furthers the idea of renunciation. The two sides of the same coin. They work together in this particular way. Yeah. So, uh, it, yeah, so the Buddha to be, he thought, had these kind of thoughts. Yeah, these things are good. But just because you think it is good, that may not be quite enough. But my mind wasn't eager for, for renunciation. It wasn't confident, settled, and decided about it. I didn't see it as peaceful. Yeah, so the uh, idea here is that uh, sometimes uh, we can have the idea in our mind, the view that renunciation is good or morality is good or kindness is good, uh, yeah, and all of these kind of things, uh, but we may not have fully understood it yet. Uh, the mind doesn't kind of fully go into it. Uh, and uh, this is, can very often be, you can see this very often. You can see, for example, that you have a view about the world, uh, yeah, a view that k a kindness, for example, is a good thing to do. But then sometimes your heart goes in a different direction. Your heart may still have cravings uh, yeah, or desires which go in a different way. Uh, or you renounce something. Uh, you give up, for example, you become a monastic. Uh, and as a monastic, you may have the view that giving things up is very positive. Uh, but sometimes the cravings are still there. Uh, yeah? The desire for worldly pleasures are still there, even though you have given up the world. Uh, and this is kind of like two things going in opposite directions. The view, the outlook going in one way, the craving going in a different way. Uh, and this is a kind of very common experience in Buddhist circles where our ideals, uh, our world view is not quite aligned with the craving inside. The craving goes one way, the view goes in one way. Uh, we know what we should be doing, uh, but our heart is not 100% into it yet. Uh, and this is the sort of thing the Buddha-to-be is talking about here. Uh, I didn't see it as peaceful. Well, I think that translation is uncertain. It can also be translated as I did see it as peaceful. <laughs> it can be translated as the exact opposite. Yeah, you can see the, you see the didn't down there. So this sentence either means I did see it as peaceful or it means I didn't see it as peaceful. Yeah. So um, which one is it? Well, um, <laughs> I think the point is still the same. Yeah? So either he sees it, uh, sees it as peaceful uh, in view but doesn't, is not fully confident. Uh, yeah? Or he doesn't really see it as peaceful because he isn't confident about it. So they, it kind of still amounts to the same thing, I think. Yeah. But I suspect that Bhante Siddhartha has got this wrong, and I think the proper translation actually is that I did see it as peaceful. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So um, then... Um, yeah. 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 Let, let's can we, let's can we carry on. We we'll come back to this in a second. Is that all right? Yeah. Come back to the Q and A in a second. Yeah. That's that's that's, that's okay. I, I understand that you are eager. I, I, who isn't? Everyone is eager on these things. So, uh, but let's just hold on a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then the Buddha says. Then I thought, uh, what is the cause? What is the reason why my mind isn't eager for for renunciation? Uh, not confident and decided about it. Why don't I see it as peaceful? Yeah, what is going on here? How come? How come that even though I, I know these things are good, why? How come the mind isn't really confident about this? Right? 
And now comes, of course, the important answer here. Then I thought, uh, I haven't seen the drawbacks of this five sense world. Yeah, the, it's um, here you have the kamesu over here. Kamesu is a plural word, and whenever kama is used in the plural, it refers to the five sense world. Uh, so I haven't seen the drawbacks of that five sense world, uh, and so I haven't cultivated that. Uh, I haven't realized the benefits of renunciation, and so I haven't developed that. Uh, yeah, so. What he's saying here is that uh, the reason why you're still attached to these things uh, and still holding on to them too much uh, is basically because you haven't cult cultivated and, and reflected enough yet on the drawbacks. What is the downside of these things? And once you see the downsides, uh, they have the word here, the adinava over here. Yeah, This is the downsides or drawbacks. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, it, it, it's why the mind doesn't leap to these things. Uh. And this is why Reflecting on the drawbacks is useful because it helps us uh, in this direction. Yeah. That's why my mind isn't eager for, an, for renunciation, not confident and settled and decided about it. Uh, and it's why I don't see it as peaceful. Uh, then I thought, uh, suppose that seeing the drawbacks of the five sense world, I were to cultivate that. Uh, and suppose that, realizing the benefits of renunciation, I were to develop that. Yeah, so these things go together, they're giving up the five sense world, uh, and then understanding the benefit of the renunciation. These are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so you cultivate both of those ideas. I'll come back in a second to how more to cultivate, seeing the drawbacks. The next sutta is going to be all about the, more about the drawbacks of that world. Uh, and of course, the... Uh, uh, the benefit of renunciation is precisely that you give up those drawbacks uh, of the five sense world uh, and you reach something, a state of mind that doesn't have those drawbacks. Uh, that's kind of the whole point here. Huh? It's possible that my mind would be eager for renunciation. It would be confident, settled and decided about it. Uh, and I would see it as peaceful. Huh? And so, after some time, I saw the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, and I cultivated that. Uh, and I realized that the benefit of renunciation, and I developed that. Uh. So you have to put in that effort uh, to uh, understand these things. Again, the, the problem is that uh, we know the benefit of the Sense, five sense world. We know that very well because we have to be cultivating that our whole lives. Uh, that is what life is about for most people. The asada is the gratification and the pleasure of the five sense world. Uh, it is known to us. The downside is really the problem. Uh, and the reason why it is easy for us to see the uh, positive side of the five sense world, but it's hard for us to see the downside, uh, the reason is because we have already have a vested interest in that world. Uh, we already come into this world with attachments and desires. Uh, and those attachments and desires mean that we will automatically seek for the good parts in that world. Uh, if you have a husband or wife or children or whatever, you will look for the good things in, the, in that person. You will look for the reason why you should carry on that family life or whatever. Uh, you have a vested interest in that world. Uh, if you have a house and a nice car and you have all the possessions in your life, uh, you have a vested interest in seeing the good things in those things uh, because you're already attached. You will see the positive, you won't see the drawback. Yeah. If, you, uh, you know, if you're living here in Malaysia, you have vested interest in seeing the, uh, uh, the, the, the positive aspects of the world around us. Yeah? Why? And that's why when you watch TV and you see things going down, you feel a sense of loss maybe, a sense of sadness about that world uh, because of that vested interest in the world being stable and carrying on uh, so the vested interest is there. That makes us see the positive side, uh, and it makes it hard for us to see the drawbacks. That's why this needs to be cultivated. Uh. And the only way to do that is to have this broader vision of a larger outlook of what life really is about. Uh. Then my mind was eager for renunciation. It was confident, settled, and decided about it. Uh. I saw it as peaceful. Uh. And so, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, uh, secluded from unskillful qualities, uh, 
I entered and remained in the first absorption, the first jhana, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected. Uh, yeah, so this is the result of practicing that, uh, seeing the downside of the five sense world. Uh, the result of that is that it gives you access to the first jhana, the uh, biggest obstacle to achieving the four jhana states uh, and to achieving the profound samadhi on the Buddhist path is, as I mentioned before, this attachment and craving that we have for the five sense world. This is the big one. Uh, and that is why you can see right here this first jhana formula. It starts off here with a sentence, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah? And uh, sensual pleasures here uh, has is the word over here uh, in Pali, kamehi, and the ehi ending here is a plural ending. Uh, so again, when it's plural, it is a reference to the five sense world, not just to desire, but to the five sense world. So you could say, quite secluded from the five sense world. Uh, the only way you can enter a state where you are secluded from the five sense world, the only way you can do that uh, is by seeing the downside of the five sense world. Uh, if you are still attached to the five sense world, uh, if you are still craving for it, there is no way you can enter a jhana because you have attachment. Attachment means you're holding on, but you have to let it go to enter the jhana, at least temporarily. Uh, so you are, this is what I mean by that you are blocking access from the deep samadhi if you're holding too much on to the five sense world. Uh, so these things go together. You cannot both hold on to the five sense world and renounce it at the same time. You have to make a choice at this part, at a certain point here. Huh? So this is what is going on here. And then, uh, so the Buddha is here saying, once you develop that, uh, seeing the drawback, then your mind gets confidence in that. It is settled in that. It is decided about it. Uh, you see it as peaceful. You understand that these samadhis, uh, these jhana states, these absorption states, uh, they are powerful, useful. Uh, they are basically, they take you towards the very meaning of life itself. Uh, this is the power of these kind of samadhi states. Uh, these are incredibly interesting and important qualities of mind that you find on the Buddhist path. Yeah? If you, when you get to these kind of things, uh, it kind of opens your eyes to a completely different reality. It's like, wow, if I had known that this was possible, uh, this is kind of really an entirely different world view uh, once samadhi really starts to bite. Uh, and uh, I love this idea that Ajahn Brahm sometimes talks about. He talks about the positive trauma. Uh, yeah, positive trauma, isn't that a nice word? Uh, it's such a beautiful word, a positive trauma. Because usually when we think about trauma, we think about something negative, something terrible, something you can't forget because, oh no, it's sitting in your mind, you can't sleep at night because of trauma. This is the positive trauma. It is so beautiful. You can never get it out of your mind. It will always be there because it is so close to the very idea of the meaning of life and what life is all about. So this is, this is what we're talking about here. Yeah? You're getting access to something that is completely life-changing, completely life-altering. It gives you a very, uh, you know, you, your attitude towards life changes completely. But you don't have to get to the jhana for this to happen. As your meditation deepens, as you start to get the taste for what these things are like, just a little bit of piti sukha is already very useful. A little bit of tranquility is already very useful because you start to see the potential for an alternative reality than the normal reality that we live in. Here. So this is uh, the idea here, yeah? the idea of gradually uncovering this, moving in this direction. And then we uh, start to approach uh, what I would call the meaning of life itself. Let's take a five minute break and then we can come back to the questions uh, uh, after that. Uh, let's do some meditation together.
Okay. Okay, so uh, we can take a few questions. Would you like to? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, um, now, because going back to the earlier statement, I think um, to yeah. me, uh, I think it is correct in the sense of the fact that I think in his Buddha's mind, he was having doubts. I think it was almost <laughs> like a solely low key, you know, just talking to himself and say, oh, these are my doubts, you know, and then yeah. uh, things, then I realized actually it's not, it should be like that. So, so that statement where he said, uh, I don't, yeah, I, don't I see it as peaceful, yeah, this one here. Yeah. 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 So I think yeah. that statement seems correct to me. In that yeah. Case, yeah. I think, I think it can be read both ways, you know, I think it's possible to read it as either I see it as peaceful, but even though I see it as peaceful, uh, I don't have full confidence. Uh, or it could be understood as uh, I don't have full confidence uh, uh, because I don't see it as peaceful. I think both ways are possible readings. Uh, the reason why I think it is wrong is simply because of the Pali grammar. I'm looking at the Pali here. Uh, and to me, it looks like the Pali is the, the negation seems to be in front of, uh, it's only each of these words are negated, yeah? The word eager is negated, the word con not confident is eager, the word sorry is negated, the word not settled is negated, uh, and not decided about. Is, you can see the word little na here, the little word na here is the negation, is in the front of each one of these words. Uh, and so it looks to me like the Pali is, is not uh, supporting that translation. That's why I'm saying it, not because I, I think you're necessarily wrong in what you are suggesting here. What do you think, uh, Yen? Uh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it looks like that does not negate that particular part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So we agree. Okay. Good. Well. <laughs> Excellent. Please. Please. Ah, yeah. Good morning. Atta. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know when we say five cent pleasure, right? Is it included the uh, including the Six sense base or the six sense contact, the mind. The mind. I well, the mind is a is a complicated thing, yeah, because the mind is uh, on the one hand the mind has its own pleasures, which are precisely the pleasures of samadhi and the pleasures you know which are the mental world, uh, and of course that mental world which are the comes in with samadhi or the, just the piti sukha that you have when watching the breath and these kind of things, or even the happiness you get from living well and being generous. Uh, all of those things are the happinesses of the mind, and they are really apart from the five sense world. Uh, yeah, but the mind is broad. The mind can also take the five sense world as its object. You can fantasize about the five sense world. You can sit in a meditation. You can think about your next meal. Right? I mean, we know what it's what it's like. Yeah? And so the mind is complex. So the the pure mind, which is removed from the five sense world, well, that mind, yes, uh, it is a sixth kind of happiness, which is beyond the five sense world. Uh, but the mind is also capable of indulging in the five sense world. Uh, so we have to then uh, look at the mind in the right way. I know that Ajahn Brahm talks about the mind as a six, and what he means is the mind which is separated from the five sense world. Uh, and doesn't think about that. Uh. Are you happy with that? Uh, yeah? Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, good. Uh. Please, uh, yeah. Who is next? Uh, yeah, go for Please, uh. Uh, Ajahn. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Ajahn. Yeah, um, Ajahn. Can Ajahn Kaini um, elaborate a little bit on the five sense? But is it relating to the eyes, ears, nose, yeah. uh, mouth, and the body? Yes. The touch. And, the um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to the hearing part, um, has it got to do with, um, I, I'm not sure what it's called, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the four pairs of praise and blame, gain and loss, and. Oh, okay. Uh, has yeah. that got to do with yeah. that as well? Just yeah, all of that is part of the five sense world. So the five sense world is almost like everything you know. Uh, yeah, because the five sense world, if you you know the e the ears, the eyes, uh, the smell, the tongue, and the touch of the body, this is the five sense world. Uh, and when you think about it, almost everything you experience is in that world. Uh, 
and uh, uh, so you can uh, and then by extension uh, uh, all the things that kind of happen in that world like for example status yeah status very important thing in human life uh, you know where are you, where are we in society what is our relation to other people uh, sta there are books written about status and it's supposed to be one of the one of the things that really are the big drivers in our human society how we can relate to each other status wise uh, that is also part of that world because uh, that that five sense world is where we negotiate status within that world. Uh, yes, yeah? so that's also part of it. Uh, uh, so this is what we're talking about: praise and blame, and gain and loss, and these kind of things. That status is part of that all that thing. Yeah. Uh, also, the idea of uh, you know being famous or not famous, being praised or not praised. That praise and non-praise happens also within the five sense world. Uh, so it is really a, all of these things kind of come back to that five sense world. So almost everything we know. Uh, is in that world, yeah? Then you go at night, you dream. What do you dream about? You dream about the five sense world, yeah? You can't get, can't get away from it. It's always around you, always there, in a sense. The only thing which is not the five sense world uh, are where the mind starts to find joy, the spiritual kind of joys. And the spiritual joys, they are the joys that come from uh, you know, feeling good about yourself because you're living well, uh, you have abandoned doing bad things, uh, the joys that come from being generous, these are the two of the most important joys on the Buddhist path. Uh, you find these are called the Sila Nusati and the Chaga Nusati. There's uh, specific names for these things in Buddhism, that's how important they are. Uh, the recollection of your generosity, the recollection of how you live well. Uh, this is where the spiritual world starts, yeah, with those kind of joys. Uh, and then the peace, the tranquility that comes with that kind of happiness is also part of that world. Uh. So the moment you close your eyes and you start to move in that direction and you start to feel these kind of happinesses, that is where you're moving away from the five sense world. Everything else is the five sense world. It's incredibly broad. Uh, and it's almost everything we know. Uh. And then you can take that spiritual world deeper and deeper until the five senses are completely gone. Uh. And that's where you enter a pure spiritual world. Uh. And that pure spiritual world is here what is called the first jhana experience, the first absorption. Uh, that is where you go completely beyond the five senses uh, and you enter a different reality. And it's a completely different reality because you have never known before the world without the five senses. So this is entering like something which is completely different uh, from what you have ever seen before. It's kind of weird and wonderful and uh, amazing for that reason. Uh, are you happy with that? Uh, yeah? Okay. Please, yeah. Ajahn morning. Good I have morning. two questions. Um, number one is this. And so, quite secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unskillful qualities. Mm. So, this, oh, could you please uh, elaborate on the unskillful qualities? Sure. And then, my second question is this. Um, on this earlier part, uh, suppose that seeing the drawbacks of sensual pleasures. Yeah. I were to cultivate that. And suppose that realizing the benefits of renunciation, I were to develop that. Yeah. Um, and possible that my mind would be eager for renunciation and confident and self -tool. So in this aspect, after seeing the drawbacks, yeah. and Buddha tried to cultivate that to discard the drawbacks of the sensual pleasures, is it? Yeah. And then also to cultivate to develop the benefits of renunciation yeah. does that also mean that trying to meditate trying to practice loving kindness or what is it on uh, okay so w what it means is that you it, it means an understanding of what can be achieved when you renounce yeah it means knowing what can be achieved so it means that you understand that by renouncing attachment and renouncing craving for those sensual pleasures, you get access to the jhanas. That's the benefit. Yeah? And because you know the power of these jhana states, even if you don't get the jhanas, even if you just get a little bit of meditation, you know that the importance of that, the happiness that comes from that, the tranquility that comes from that, is so important, it is so powerful, huh? that that is the benefit of renunciation. Huh? Yeah? Those are the benefits, the spiritual happiness, the spiritual tranquility is precisely the benefit of renunciation. Uh, it actually goes beyond that. It goes beyond even the achievement of these things because it also gives you access to insight, for example, because you are purifying the mind of the vested interest in that world. Uh, when you don't have craving and desire, then when you take away the vested interest, uh, 
That is when the mind becomes even. As long as you have vested interest in something, uh, you can't see it properly. Uh, you don't have the upeka. Upeka means to look on. Uh, that upeka is really completely necessary to be able to see things clearly. Uh, as long as you're attached to that world, uh, there's vested interest, and for that reason you can't see it neutrally. That neutral view is completely necessary to be able to gain insight. Uh, so all of these things are only available as a benefit of renunciation. Uh, actually, I was, uh, I was trying to ask is, uh, what, what does Buddha do to cultivate that, uh, to the, how to cultivate the kind of drawback? Like, is this mean that he's trying to discard yeah. the, the essential? And yeah. then to develop, what does he do to develop these um, benefits of uh, renunciation? Well, this, this is what I'm saying now. This is what he's doing here. This is my answer. My answer is that he knows he already has some achievement in, in, in samadhi, right? He already has had some jhana experiences before, so he knows the benefits. So he just has to remind himself of those benefits. Uh, I know this, yeah? Why is this? And then he understands why is this important? Uh, why is it important to have the samadhi and the jhanas? Well, it is important because uh, it actually, uh, I lose this vested interest in the world. I lose all of these things and I get again access to insight, all this. So he reflects on that again and again to make sure he understands that, right? Uh, but you're right, it all, it, he also, part of that is also the achievement of the samadhi because when you achieve the samadhi, uh, uh, that of course is necessary to remind yourself of the benefit. Uh, because after a while it fades away a little bit, and when it fades away you maybe forget that. So you're right, it also means attaining it, maybe also loving kindness. Uh, and as you do all of those things and you reflect on why it is powerful, that is how you understand the benefit of renunciation. Uh, when it comes to the drawback of the uh, five senses, we'll come back to that in a second, because there's a whole sutta afterwards called the Maha Dukkha Kanda Sutta, which means the great heap of suffering, right? So we, so we, so just to make sure we are not getting too optimistic here, yeah. So we kind of remember the downsides of things, uh, yeah. So we're going to look at that. Uh, I want to let me come to your second question. Uh, I'll come to the second question straight away as, once we get the once we get the the, uh, the uh, technical expertise here to sort things out. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, <laughs> We're very fortunate to have free tech help. You know, that's, that's really nice. Most people have to pay for these things, and uh, we don't have to pay for it. Uh. <laughs> so then we come to the question that you had about secluded from unskillful qualities. What does that mean? And this is actually, thank you for bringing that up, because it is important. And um, as always, let's look to the Pali first of all. Yes, this is kind of nice that we have the Pali and the English. So this is the Pali is over here, is Vivicha uh, Akusalehi Damehi. Yeah, this is the the, the Pali for secluded from unskillful qualities. So, Dhamma is qualities. Uh, yeah, Dhamma is qualities. Akusala here is uh, unskillful. So, you can say unskillful or bad or unwholesome qualities. Uh, and then you have Vivicha, which means separated from or secluded from. Uh, so, you are separated from these unwholesome or unskillful qualities. Uh, and what that means is the five hindrances, uh, right? Because uh, this is what you have abandoned to enter the jhana states. Uh, now that is interesting because one of the five hindrances is karma chanda. And karma chanda is the desire for the five sense world, right? So that means that viviceva kamehi must have a different meaning than the first hindrance because the first hindrance has already been included in vivicha akusalehi damehi. Secluded from unwholesome qualities, one aspect of that is that you don't have karma chanda anymore. You don't have desire for the five sense world. That means that the first part of this thing, secluded from sensual pleasures, must mean something else than uh, separated from desire for that world. Yeah? And so what it means, it means separation from the five senses. Yeah? And again, you can see that because kamehi, kamehi is a plural. Huh? When the karma, the word karma is used in the plural, it always refers to the five senses. When it's used in the singular, then it means desire, because the word desire is usually singular. Yeah, you don't have desire is just a singular word. And all the words in the Pali Canon that talk about desire, there's lots and lots of words. You have raga, you have chanda, you have tanha, you have loba, all these things mean desire. They're almost always found in the singular. 
Karma is the exception. It's almost always found in the plural. Huh? Occasionally in the singular, then it means desire, but in the plural, it refers to the five senses. It's a very important point, and I was discussing this the other day here with, uh, with someone else, this particular point. It's a very important point, because if you get these kind of things wrong, uh, uh, then you don't really practice the path fully. Uh, that kind of can be very, very problematic. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends what you mean by sensual pleasures, right? Uh, but I would say that to really understand what is going on here, it actually means secluded from the five senses. Uh, yeah, and I, th I know that that's what uh, Bhante Sujato means by that. Uh, but he, but for consistency's sake, he, he uses the word uh, translation sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah. Um, we, it's, can, can we can we wait with your question to next time around? Will that be all right? Uh, please please write it down or something. We we'll come back to it because it's already time is going fast. Uh, so we will uh, come back to it. I'm not trying to discriminate against the Germans. Uh, this is just uh, <laughs> we kind of do things on the right time. So you're not German? I thought you said you were German. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Very good. Uh. <laughs> You speak, you speak German, is that right? Yeah. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, carry on a little bit. Yeah. So this is then what we see here is the uh, uh, standard uh, uh, description uh, of the first jhana, yeah? And this is kind of a very interesting description. I'm not going to go into it too much now because we are still kind of working on the early part of the path about right view and how that right view drives the path. Uh, so I'm not going to kind of uh, spend too much time on this particular thing here. Yeah. So let's... Um, now I have, I have to go back to uh, the... Um, Let me just go back here to see what was included, what I included in this. Uh, oh, okay, I have all the four jhanas in there. I'm not sure why I did that. That was probably a bad idea, actually. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's, yeah, let's go in a little bit more because there's something more interesting going on here, which is fascinating, which is kind of interesting, yeah. So then, uh, after attaining the first, we can come back to discuss the jhana formula later on, but for now, let's just uh, let it be for now. And then it goes on, and it says, while I was in that meditation, perceptions and attentions accompanied by sensual pleasures beset me, and that was an affliction for me. Suppose a happy person were to experience pain, that would be an affliction for them. In the same way, when perceptions, attention accompanied by sensual pleasures beset me, uh, that was an affliction for me. Uh, yeah, so... Um, what is uh, going on here? Uh, and one of the um, interesting things here, it looks like, when you read this particular sentence, it looks like while you was in that meditation, in other words, while I was... Uh, during the meditation, during the meditation itself, sensual pleasures arose. But actually, that is not really possible, because you have to abandon the sensual pleasures prior to entering. Uh, so they cannot actually happen within the meditation. So the really, the, uh, you know, sometimes it, it takes quite a bit of interpretation of the suttas and to see how words are used in many different contexts, uh, to see how things are. Uh, uh, but the meaning here is in the during the general time when I was doing this meditation, right? Uh, during the general period, not exactly when you're doing it, uh, but in that period of time, uh, if sensual pleasures arise, uh, then they seem like pain to you. Uh, yeah, they seem problematic. And the reason, of course, is that the happiness of the se of the jhana is so profound uh, and is so peaceful and so quiet uh, that when the sensual impact comes to you, the sensual pleasures arises in you. Actually, I'm probably got getting this wrong, actually, yeah, because what it means here is the, uh, basically the uh, sensual experience of the five senses is probably actually the meaning here. Yeah. So the experience of the five senses in general seems unpleasant yeah, because the five senses are so coarse compared to the first jhana. Yeah, the five senses are always moving around, yeah, 
when you have experienced the five senses, there is no real peace because the five senses are by definition always changing. Yeah, when you are watching the world, seeing, when you're hearing, there's always change. Uh, and that change is basically something which is uh, painful compared to the stability and the power of the, the first jhana experience. Uh. So it is painful. You don't want to have anything to do with the five senses anymore. Yeah? And this shows you the kind of... Uh, uh, problem that we're dealing with when we're dealing with the five senses. Uh, we're dealing with something is very hard to fully appreciate uh, how problematic they are until you enter a different reality that is more profound. Uh, then you can see the five senses in perspective from that higher reality, which is the jhana reality. Uh, you can understand why it is painful, why it is problematic. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, and it's just that the, it's just a translate. It's just a Pali in interpretation of the Pali. That's really what it is, you see here. Yeah. And uh, the, what the Pali says, uh, while while I was dwelling, I mean, the, 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 the way to the way to understand these kind of sentences, you have to see how it is used elsewhere in the suttas. Uh, only then can you really understand what these things mean, right? Uh, sometimes the meaning is not obvious and straightforward. Uh, so when you say, while I was living like that, does that mean while you were in the detainment, or does it mean in the general period when you were living and practicing like that? Uh, you see the difference? Uh, yeah? And uh, to be able to know whether one interpretation is correct and the other one is correct, uh, you have to see how this kind of phrasing, how this particular phrasing is used in the suttas. And this is what translation and interpretation is about. Uh, yeah, and this is why it is complex. And this is why you have to actually read quite broadly sometimes to understand it. But I can show you passages in the suttas where the meaning of this is not actually during the attainment, but during the general period when I was practicing this attainment. It's a quite important difference. So, um, uh, but uh, regardless, the, I think the point is still the same. So, but roughly the same point anyway. So it doesn't really matter all that much. So the point here is just that sensual pleasures or the world of the five senses uh, is an affliction. It is a pain compared to the first jhana. That is the main point. Uh, and this sometimes, uh, if you haven't been there yourself, we have to take this on confidence from the Buddha, yeah, that this actually is true or from other people who have these attainments uh, and that there's no much choice really but to, uh, to do that until you get there yourself. Uh. That is kind of a neat little point for you. Uh, and then the Buddha, and of course this is what is interesting about the Buddha, he doesn't stop there. Then he carries on and then he looks at the first jhana experience uh, and he sees the uh, kind of the downsides or the negative aspects of the first jhana and then he goes on to the second jhana based on that. Uh, then he sees kind of the, uh, the lower aspect of the second jhana and this is kind of really hard to do because when you get to these jhana experiences uh, you have basically found something that seems to Almost anyone, this is the meaning of life. How can you see the downside of something that is pure bliss? Yeah, but this is what the Buddha does. This is what makes the Buddha the Buddha, is that he has this ability to really focus on any negative remaining aspect, yeah, and then kind of let go of that, and then go even deeper. And he goes, continues on this way, until he reaches the full awakening experience. And this is the rest of this particular sutta right there. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to drop all of that. I'm not going to go through it because it is just too much for now. Maybe we can come back to it later on once we have the, uh, uh, gone through the other parts of the suit that are really important. So, um, now let's move on to the next sutta. And uh, please feel free to ask about this sutta afterwards if you wish, uh, and we can just come back to this other sutta afterwards. Uh. So now we're going to come to the um, what is called the Chulla Dukkha Kanda Sutta, the shorter discourse on the mass of suffering. Uh. <laughs> so I uh, hope you're ready for that. Uh. And if you're not ready, we're going to do it anyway. So. Um. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, so let's just uh, get started. And now we're going to look at the adinava, the downside of sensual pleasures. Uh, and this is what this sutta really is about. Uh, and uh, uh, it is kind of the longest exposition on the downside of sensual pleasures. And what you will find is that it is very straightforward. Uh, it is not a very complicated sutta. And it's very easy to understand what the Buddha is on about in these things. Uh, so it starts off like most suttas. Uh, so I have heard, Evang me suttang. At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans, uh, near Kapilavattu in the Banyan Tree Monastery. Uh, so he's staying with his relatives, uh, right? The Sakyans. Uh, and Kapilavattu, of course, being the uh, main city or the main town. It's all very small scale in those days. The main town of the Sakyans uh, in the Nigrodharama. Nigrodharama is the Banyan Tree Monastery. Yeah, Arama has this nice double meaning in Pali. It, on the one hand it means like a park. Yeah, and this is the Aramas were things that the kings of the day would have. Uh, um, and uh, they would then often give those Aramas to the Sangha because uh, there would be useful places for the Sangha to establish monasteries and build up monasteries. Uh, they mean both a park and they also mean a monastery. Uh, yeah, so we have the uh, uh, this double kind of meaning. So that's why the monasteries are often quite delightful places. Uh, and uh, one of the kind of the nice things that comes from that is to remind uh, uh, us that uh, the Buddhist path is always about the middle way here. Uh, when the Buddha and the monastics practice, they often choose beautiful places to practice. Uh, if you remember the, uh, the discourse that we did before, the Noble Search Sutta, uh, well, in the Noble Search, the Buddha uh, to be, he goes through all the ascetic practices, uh, and then he thinks, is there an alternative way to awakening? Right? And that's when he remembers the jhana experience that he had as a child and all of that. Uh, and then uh, he goes to a nice place to meditate, a place with close to the river, because the river is a place you can bathe, maybe a place you get water from, a, a delightful grove. You can imagine a grove in the forest which maybe has is open, nice shading trees. Maybe there's some mango trees there where the mangoes kind of drop into your hands, right? And when they're ni nice and ripe, uh, I, I don't know. And there's a village nearby for arms. Uh, and, it, and this kind of signifies the idea that the Buddha-to-be has discovered the middle way here. Uh, it is secluded from society, but it is a beautiful place in the forest. Uh, and in the same way, the monks usually live in monasteries. Uh, they are usually quite nice places, the monasteries. Uh, they're not too harsh. Uh, it is not about ascetic practices. It is about the middle way. You are secluded from the city, uh, but your natural environment is actually quite delightful. Uh, this is the idea of an arama. It's a park and also a monastery at the same time. Uh, signifies the idea of the middle way. Uh, not, uh, and that's when you practice the middle way, that is when the body, the senses, all of that disappears. Uh, too much pain, the senses are important. Too much happiness, the senses are important. When there's no pain and no pleasure, that is where it fades away and the meditation becomes possible. Uh, then Mahanama, the Sakyan, went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, uh, for a long time, sir, I have understood your teaching like this. Greed, hatred and delusion are corruptions of the mind. Um, let me just stop there very briefly. And just uh, Mahanama the second. Mahanama was a, a cousin of the Buddha. Mahanama was the brother of Anuruddha. You heard about Anuruddha? Yeah, everyone heard about Anur Anuruddha, one of the very kind of famous monks. He was famous for his uh, uh, the divine eye. It can also be called clairvoyance, if you like. The idea, ability to see far away and to see other realms and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, Mahanam and Anuruddha, they uh, decided that one of them had to go forth, but only one could go forth, uh, because the other one had to stay home to look after the family business, right? Uh, and this story is found in the Vinaya Pitaka, which is what the part of the canon that I have translated, actually. Yeah. And so the story is found there. You know the story of Mahanama and Anuruddha? Yeah. Don't know. Okay, I'll tell you the story in brief. Yeah. So the story is like this. And the Buddha has now become the Buddha already. Yeah. And all the Sakyans, they're very inspired by the Buddha. Yeah, because it's their cousin, it is their kind of their kinsman. Yeah. 
uh, really inspired by the Buddha. So many of the Sakyans say, well, we should also go forth. Uh, we should follow the Buddha because he is our kinsman. Uh, and then the same thing happens in the family of Anuruddha and Mahanama. Right? They say, well, everyone is going forth. Uh, one of us should also go forth. We can't both go forth because if we both go forth, uh, there will be no one to look after the household. Yeah? Everything will disappear. Huh? And so uh, Mahanama goes to Anuruddha and says, well, one of us should go forth. And Anuruddha says to Mahanama, well, I have been, when I was, I was a child, I was, everything was so plush. Yeah? I was looked after. I had every need met. And uh, Anuruddha is the one with the famous nutty cakes. You know the story about the nutty cakes? Ajahn Brahm tells, the nutty, tells about the nutty cake. The nutty cake story is that uh, whenever Anuruddha wanted a cake, the cake was always available. Yeah? Whatever he wanted, he could always have it. Uh, he had this very soft upbringing. He was the softest person around. No one was as soft as Anuruddha. And one day, there wasn't any more cakes. So his mother said to him, nutty cakes. Nutty means there is no cakes. Uh, and Anuruddha thought, what is this nutty cakes? That sounds like an interesting kind of cake. Yeah? Because he didn't hear there is no cake. What he heard is that there's a cake called nutty, which means there isn't anything. That's how soft his up upbringing was. Yeah? Please give me some, some of those nutty cakes. Uh, give me some of those there is no cake cakes. <laughs> so that's Anuruddha. So he was very kind of soft. And he, so Anuruddha says to Mahanama, I have been brought up with so much softness. I cannot, there's no way I can deal with renunciant life. Yeah, it's too hard for me, living in the forest, all that. I need my nutty cakes. <laughs> and so then the Mahanama says, okay, very well, I will go forth. You stay in the household life. But then I will have to teach you all the duties of the household life. And so he says to Anuruddha, well, you know, so Anuruddha, oh, okay, what are the duties of the house? He doesn't have a clue, Anuruddha. He doesn't know anything about anything, right? He's completely clueless. <laughs> So what are the duties? Well, the duties are that when the kind of the so when the season comes uh, to plant, kind of to kind of put to to cultivate the fields, uh, then you have to go out and you have to plow the fields. Uh, after plowing the fields, you have to put the seeds uh, into the fields. Uh, after putting the seeds in, you have to water the fields. Uh, when you have watered the fields, then you have to. Uh, 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 drain the water, you have to let the water come in, then you have to drain the water, then you have to weed the fields to get all the weeds out. Uh, when you have weeded the fields and all the crop has come out, then you have to reap and harvest the crops. Uh, once you have harvested the crops, you have to uh, kind of thrash it to get the grain out of the stems. Uh, when you have put that, you have to put it into storage, right? Uh, and when it's in the storage, you have to guard it in storage. Uh, and then uh, when they finally get to the end of that and it finally is stored, uh, then the next season begins and it starts all from scratch again. Uh. <laughs> and then Anuruddha says, but when does it all stop? When does it come to an end? And Mahanama said, it never comes to an end. While they were plowing their fields, our fathers and our grandfathers died while they were still plowing the fields. Yeah? And at this point, Anuruddha says, okay, you stay in the home life, I will go forth. <laughs> this is a story, right? It's a very sweet kind of story. Yeah. But Anuruddha, he was too soft. He couldn't deal with the home life, so he decided to go forth after all. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so then, this is why Mahanama is here, and he is still the Mahanama the Sakyan. Yeah. And he is a lay person, and he goes to the Buddha. And he asked this question. Yeah, this is where all of this comes from. Uh. So um, then he says, For a long time, sir, I have understood your teachings like this. Uh, yeah? Greed, hate, and delusions are corruptions of the mind. Uh. Yes, yeah, so you can see here the word corruption is the word upakilesa over here. It's related to the word kilesa. And uh, upakilesa is the usual word found in the suttas. Uh. So yeah, for a long time I have understood your teachings like this, and that can mean, it could mean that maybe he is a noble person. Uh, yeah, he is a stream mentor or something, because it's a stream mentor who will understand these things fully. It is not entirely clear whether he is a stream mentor or not, but it may be that he is a stream mentor. A little bit uncertain, but he understands that these things are problematic. Yeah? He knows that greed or desire, hate or maybe ill will is better delusion or perhaps confusion, uh, these things are problematic. Uh, 
they lead to down the wrong way. Uh, and uh, we should really purify ourselves from these things. This is kind of the implication of this. Uh. Despite understanding this, uh, sometimes my mind is occupied by thoughts of desire, ill will, and confusion. Yeah, even though I know these things are there, still my mind is occupied by these things. Uh. I wonder what qualities remain in me that I have such thoughts. Yeah? Why is it that even though I understand the problem of these things, still they come and invade my mind? It's a very interesting question, right? What is going on here? How come this problem still arises even though I have this kind of understanding? This is his question, and then let's see what the Buddha has to say about this. Mahanama, there is a quality that remains in you that makes you have such thoughts. Yeah, there is something that you need to do, in other words, something you have to remove. For if you had given up that quality, you would not still be living at home and enjoying sensual pleasures. So in other words, if you really give up those qualities, uh, you would become a monastic because uh, living the home life doesn't make any sense anymore once you uh, give up those kind of uh, qualities, uh, qualities within him. But because you haven't given up that quality, you are still living at home and enjoying sensual pleasures. Uh, sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress, uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, so uh, the uh, quality that uh, um, Mahanama has not given up is obviously this interest, the attachment, uh, the desire, the craving for the essential pleasures. That is really the quality that he hasn't given up. Uh, and uh, as we shall see now, this is why the Buddha now talks about the drawbacks of these things, uh, so as to understand the downside of these things, uh, and then that giving access uh, to the, what is called the higher mind, the Adi Chitta in the suttas. Uh, even though a noble disciple has clearly seen this with right wisdom, so long as they don't achieve the rapture and bliss that are apart from the five sense world, uh, yeah, the sensual pleasures uh, and unskillful qualities, uh, or something even more peaceful than that, uh, they might still return to sensual pleasures. Or might still, they still they still do return to sensual pleasure. The Pali, uh, Atta Ko Nevatava Anavati, yeah, they still have that, that tendency, or maybe they still do actually uh, return to sensual pleasures. So, so what we are, what he, the Buddha is saying here, that even if you are a noble disciple, yeah, even if you are a stream mentor, even if you have actually understood these teachings properly and fully through your own insight, uh, unless you have access to those happinesses that are beyond the sensory world, the mind will tend to incline back to sensual pleasures again, and, uh, uh, enjoying the five sense world as a consequence. Yeah, and this is because we want happiness. Everyone wants happiness, and if you can't have the higher happinesses, then you will be satisfied with the lower happinesses. And the Buddha says in many places in the suttas uh, that uh, for ordinary people, Unless, if you don't have that deeper insight into the nature of things, uh, your mind will always look for the five sense world, look there for happiness, uh, because you haven't got access to the higher happiness. Uh, that is what that is about. Uh, yeah? So you either enjoy the five sense world, or you enjoy the higher happinesses. Uh, yeah? you, you, you have to find happiness somewhere. This is what this means. Uh, so, and then as long as you don't have that happiness of the higher world, that's what he's saying here, uh, then uh, you will tend towards sensuality. Uh, yeah, so long as you don't achieve that happiness, this is the rapture and bliss that are apart from sensual pleasures. This basically means the jhana states. Uh, uh, to a lesser extent, it also means the ordinary happiness of meditation. If you haven't got that, uh, sensual pleasures is going to be your happiness. Uh, but when they do achieve that rapture and bliss, or something more peaceful than that, even higher kinds of samadhi, fourth jhana, immaterial attainments perhaps, they will not return to sensual pleasures. So uh, this is uh, 
Uh, you can see here what is happening here is that uh, it is quite tricky because uh, if you haven't got the higher mind already, the deep samadhi experience, if you haven't got that, your mind will automatically move towards sensual pleasures. Uh, so, but on the other hand, you have to give up the sensual pleasures to be able to achieve the higher mind. Uh, so it sounds like an impossible task, right? Uh, if you haven't got it, you, you know, you, you, you can't give them up, uh, but if you can't give them up, then you can't get it. So wh what are you going to do? Uh, it's like you are trapped somehow. Uh, so what we have to do is that we have to gradually shift the balance by gradually starting to enjoy the meditation and the happiness and joy meditation. We gradually we lose some of the attachment and the desire for the five sense world. Uh, and as so one goes up uh, and the other one goes down, uh, and gradually we shift the balance. Uh, and then one day you are able to let go of those five sense worlds temporarily, and that is where you have the chance to access those jhana states. And then after that you have a different understanding of the world, a different understanding of that reality. Yeah. So let me stop there. We're going to carry on with the sutta uh, after lunch, but I want to give us a little bit of time to ask a few more questions because I have uh, promised that. Let's do a quick a little bit of meditation first, a little bit of a break, and then we'll come back to the questions.
Okay, everyone. So let us uh, carry on. So, uh, would you like to ask your question now? Uh, yeah, please, far away. Do you, do you mind if I ask you where you are from? <laughs> yes, Achan. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm from Switzerland. Switzerland, ah, very okay. close okay, neighbor cool. to Germany, and yeah. uh, we speak German. You speak Switzerland? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'd like to share a, a, a thought uh, uh, on that. Uh, uh, nowadays, in the modern world, in the contemporary world, uh, we we know well the word the word spirituality. Uh, I'm uh, being spiritual. Spirituality. I think that is uh, that is nowadays is a word that is in common use and is a modern word that is uh, uh, accepted. Uh, that is that is uh, that is on, a, on the on the on the positive side usually when when when. Uh, so the world the the word spirituality is uh, is, is is known to us and is is is, is accepted. Uh, I had. Uh, I would like to say that uh, mm, when we think of the, that spirituality, spirit. There is the word. There is the word mind. Spirit is can can be can be said as as, as equal to mind. Yeah. Uh, because we don't have a word like mind mindality or something like this so we use spirituality uh, that could be seen or I, s I understand this, this spirituality as the opposite or the other side of of sensuality uh, or the spiritual life could be seen as the opposite of the life that is of the sensual life or of the life that is immersed in in sensuality yep. so i think that is also we talk about today we talk about spirituality we talk about spiritual life but it is not talked about sensuality or the sensual life now we talk about it right we hear about it the sensual life that uh, that is a that is a problem and that is actually opposed to the to the to the, at the ultimately opposed to the spirituality, to the spiritual life. So I think it's also to understand spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's good to understand that this is actually the opposite of sensuality. Yeah. Yep. That is that is my my insight. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. it could also be seen here in the uh, talks about. About uh, uh, this, uh, Tapusa talks about the uh, dividing line. I think dividing line, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that that on the one side are the householders. We love the spirit. We love the yeah. the sensual life, and uh, talks about there is a di di dividing line. And on the on the other on the one side of this dividing line is is the is the mendicant. Uh, that that is you. And the other side is the is the worldly life, the sensual life, the householder that are we. Uh, but we could also put it in a way on the on the on the one side of the dividing line is the sensuality. Yeah. On the other side of that line is the spirituality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that is my no, sharing. Th yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for that point. And I, I think it is. Uh, I I think it is an important point. And I, the first thing I would like to say to that, just as a kind of a little bit of a response to what you're saying, is that uh, the word spirituality is used in Buddhism. Uh, I, would a complete, I would agree with your general idea that that's how we should use it in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, but there are many people in the world who use spirituality in a, in a, in a way which is much more, uh, even includes sensuality in the world. Yeah? And that, that to me is very problematic and it doesn't really work. Yeah? And you see that in some of the modern religions where people mix up the sensual world and the spirituality and make it into a, a big soup that actually is very uh, very problematic yeah. uh, but uh, but more importantly I, I, I want to come back to your point about this distinction between the lay people and monastic because 
such a distinction doesn't really exist in quite the way we see in that sutta. The reality, of course, is, as you say, the distinction really is between the people who cultivate the mind and the people who cultivate sensuality. And you find a broad range of differences within monastics and also within lay people. There isn't any separation. The monastics are here, the lay people are there. A lot of monastics are not cultivating the mind properly. Yeah, we see this in the world. They're not really interested in meditation practice, uh, and they're more interested in status and climbing the hierarchy of the monastic order. Yeah, than uh, these kind of things. Uh, on the other hand, you find some lay people who are beautiful people, incredibly spiritual people who are more monastic than the monastics are. Yeah, I, I mean, I know lay people who are extraordinarily practitioners of this path. Uh, and many of you here, too, are very impressive as, as lay people. Uh, so I think that is a very important point, because otherwise it sounds like we are elevating the monastics in kind of the wrong way, and maybe you know, talking about the lay people in the wrong, but actually understanding that within both of these groups, uh, there's a large, large variety. Uh, and I have to admit, sometimes I am more impressed with some of the lay people that I see than many of the monastics that I see, to be honest with you, because uh, this is the reality of life, that uh, uh, this variety is actually actually there. So I think it's an important point, uh, and thank you for bringing that up, and I, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, good. Uh, anyone else? We've got a couple of minutes left before the lunch breaks. At the back there, we have someone. Uh, oh, Ajahn, I, I actually yeah. have questions. Please, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly from this sutta, is that uh, yeah. the Arya Sawaka, the noble disciple, yeah. have problems um, achieving jhana. So, if that is the case for someone with right view, how uh, I, I think it, it will be much harder for putu jhana who has wrong view, mm. isn't it? Mm. So, mm. Uh, yeah, I, I think it is actually a how to say it, this sutta makes it. Sounds like it's an insurmountable <laughs> goal. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is not insurmountable. It is just that it takes, it takes dedication, commitment, and perseverance to do it. Uh, but uh, it is something that anyone can do. And, uh, you know, understanding the, uh, this downside is just a matter of just really being committed to it. Uh, and uh, remember that many, some of these people who were Arya Savaka's noble disciples, they, in many ways, they had quite ordinary lives in many ways. Mahanama was a very busy person. Uh, so it depends a lot on how you live your life as well, yeah, how committed you are, what kind of life you have. Uh, and uh, I don't know what kind of life you, <laughs> you have, but uh, it, it, it is true. I mean, if you are living an ordinary life with a family and a job and all of those kind of things, then it is going to be, it, it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, but it depends on when, how often you go on retreat. It depends on uh, the commitment, how often you come here to hang out with the Kala and Amitas, it depends on so many factors. Uh, so never think of it as, as insurmountable. Think of instead as uh, something that needs real commitment and dedication to get there. That's really the critical point. Uh, if you have that commitment, sometimes even the Arya Sabakas don't necessarily have that commitment, you see. They're kind of happy what they're doing, they're so busy, they forget about the Dhamma. And because of that, they backslide. If they were committed, they would have jhanas all the time. Uh, so that's kind of the, the thing there. So please don't lose heart. I don't think that is the right uh, thing. Just do the very best you can on this path. Even if you don't get to the jhana, you can get close to them. Yeah? You can move in that direction. And so at least when you come to your next life, you are one step closer to the goal. Yeah? And then you can carry, carry on from there. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Over here, uh, Ang, just the uh, front, front bench over here. Yeah. So okay, what do Ajahn? Uh, can I just refer to the Tapusa Sutta, the one that we skip on the jhanas? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to clarify. So you mentioned that the drawbacks that the Buddha contemplated on that was in the general meditation, not during jhanas. Yeah. Okay. It's just generally, you know, if, when he's, because you contemplate those drawbacks mm -hmm. when you're outside of the jhana state, and then you, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Can Can you please uh, yeah. clarify? I mean, like. Explain about the drawbacks in in um, your f future talks uh, on the jhanas when you when you come back to the jhanas. Uh, uh, co the drawbacks. Talked about the drawbacks of the jhanas. Uh. Yeah, the, the ones that the Buddha contemplated on. 
There's a mention in the. Okay, I. To be honest with you, I wouldn't be too concerned about that uh, because uh, it is almost impossible to really understand until you get clo very close to those jhanas. Because uh, when you have the greatest bliss you ever experienced in your life, uh, and then you have to contemplate the drawback, it is not. It is. It is very hard to do, right? It's very difficult. Uh, if you are able to contemplate the drawback of sensual pleasure, that is difficult enough. But that is easy compared to contemplating the drawback of the jhana. That is really, really hard uh, because it is so incredibly blissful. Uh, so do one step at a time. Uh, if you start contemplating the drawback of the jhanas, you're going to lose your way because it's not going to be... Uh, it's just too far ahead, if you know. Uh, unless your samadhi is incredibly good. If you are very good samadhi already, then we can talk about the jhanas. But uh, I would recommend most people to wait. And, uh, when you get closer to the jhana states, uh, then you can go to someone who is a very skilled meditator with those things and maybe ask in private, uh, uh, you know, I'm here, what, you know, what is the next step? And then you may hear, well, actually, uh, you know, these aspects of the first jhana are problematic, so let that go, then you go to the second jhana, etc. Uh, yeah. That's Thank what I would recommend. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Anyway, it is already 11 o'clock, so maybe we can uh, stop there. Uh, and... Uh, then we will have a nice lunch break. So please have a nice lunch, everyone. And then we'll see you back again here at 1 o'clock. Yeah.